and the emails were not coming. <laughs> and I found them, of course, in my, my spam folder. So I was able to proceed mm-hmm. and pay the rent, which is good. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, that is to, paying the rent, I think, is probably mm-hmm. a, a good thing. Good for you. Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast. For anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by emojis. Okay, now, I recognize that last week I also said something that made me sound old, but I do not get emojis. I don't use emojis. I don't send emojis. But in particular... I cannot read emojis like they they come through on my phone so tiny that I don't know what anyone is trying to say with them. Do either of you have this problem? That also makes you sound old. Oh, they're just so tiny. <laughs> so, Chris, do you do you have this problem with uh, seeing emojis? Uh, well, I keep thinking of emojis as being like sort of, you know, neo punk rock bands. Oh, yeah, like, I can see. I can see where that comes sing- from. Sing disco songs. So it's I like think you're thinking of emo, emo, yeah. whatever, you know. The Bee Gees meets, you know, The Cure. Yeah, I don't know about that. But anyway, I am Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. And I am joined once again with Dr. Chris Gill from the Department of Global Health. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Matt. Hey, hey Jess. How are you both? Doing well. Hi. And our, our third chair, we have Dr. Jess Liebler from the Environmental Health. Welcome, Jess. Hi, thank you. And as a reminder to everyone, we would love it if you'd go over to the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. That's BU's hub for lifelong learning, all kinds of interesting stuff going on over there. And also, if you could give us a rating on your favorite podcast app, we always appreciate that. So on to the show. So today in our first segment, which is our Journal Club segment, we're going to talk about a study that looked at the effect of on-site versus transport-based resuscitation. And then in the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we're going to talk about precision public health and whether or not that's a a thing, and if it is, whether it's something we should be taking advantage of. And then in our third segment, which is our amazing and amusing, we'll get into the things that make us laugh out loud or just blew our minds. So, Let's get into our first segment, our Journal Club segment, where we looked at an article on the impact of on-site resuscitation compared to transport. It was published in JAMA, and the study was titled The Association of Intra-Arrest Transport versus Continued On-Scene Resuscitation with Survival to Hospital Discharge Among Patients with Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest. That is such a long title. (laughs) <laughs> it's by first author Brian Granau of the Department of Emergency Medicine at St. Paul Hospital in Vancouver. Again, I didn't find a lot of headlines on this one, but I'll give you the one that I found, which was in mid-page today, which says, for cardiac arrest, too hasty transport gets in the way of good CPR. That mm, headline may be going a little farther than I would necessarily go, but Jess, can you tell us what this study was about and, and what they did and what they found? Sure. This was an interesting study with actually some fairly substantial implications for kind of community-based EMS, EMT treatment of people who are experiencing heart attacks. So basically what the authors were looking at, they were asking the question of if transport during cardiac arrest resulted in worse or better outcomes compared to continued CPR or continued resuscitation efforts on the scene. So looking at basically the exposure of coming to pick someone up in an ambulance and taking them to the hospital while they're having a heart attack and whether that was a good thing or not. So it's kind of as much as the title's kind of wordy. And, you know, as I was going through this paper, I'm certainly not a cardiologist, you know, a cardiologist or a cardiovascular epidemiologist. They, 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 they didn't like help those of us get through some of the long acronyms and words as much as they could have, but it remains, it's a very interesting paper. So this is a perspective perspective cohort study that takes place within the context. It's a secondary data analysis looking prospectively at patients within a registry called the Resuscitation Out 
Outcomes Consortium, Cardiac Epidemiologic Registry. They looked at patients who were enrolled in this registry from 2011, April 2011 to June 20, uh, 2015, and they looked at patients who were recorded in the database across across the United States at 10 North American sites. So this was a large, a large population-based study. And the transport itself was the exposure that they were looking at. So these are all patients who were experiencing cardiac arrest, and the participants who were transported during their cardiac arrest were designated as the exposed group, and patients who were not transported, who were where there was resuscitation efforts continued on scene, were designated as the unexposed group. So they were collecting from the medical records, they were collecting patient characteristics, time-stamped treatments. The time ends up being, as we'll get to in a few minutes, one of their most interesting findings. Mm -hmm. um, they were collecting kind of information on what interventions were done at what times for all these patients as well. The follow-up continued so there, the, until the date of hospital discharge or death, with the primary endpoint being survival to hospital discharge. But they looked at a series of secondary endpoints, um, the main one is also survival with favorable neurological outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so survival upon survival and hospital discharge, and then survival with favorable neurological outcomes. Those were those two, the two endpoints. They were also looking for at duration of time until return of spontaneous circulation. This is where they were starting to lose me with some of the long mm -hmm. acronyms. And so as we were talking about in our last episode, they were also using a propensity score approach to, to try to deal with these potential confounding factors in a very large data set to try to reduce the effect of confounding on their analysis. And they were using this in particular, the authors mention a unique type of bias to this research area. And I know Matt, from what my students tell me, you love talking about all the multitudes of, bio, of types of bias in your class. Let's see if you've heard about this one. This one's called resuscitation time bias, mm. which means it means that those who are eligible for transport have already failed initial resuscitative efforts, which is also associated with poor outcomes. So one of the reasons why they did this propensity score approach was to deal with that particular bias. And so they use time, they use this time-dependent propensity score approach to match exposed participants to unexposed participants. They were calculating risk differences and risk ratios using Poisson regression. Okay. They also did an interesting sub-analysis looking at whether time to transport mattered at what time during the process of the individual's cardiac arrest were they transported and was that correlated with worse outcomes if they were transported earlier or if they were transported later following a period of on-site resuscitation. So there were about 57,000 patients in this data set, of which about 40, 44, a little less than 43,000 were eligible for inclusion in the study. Of that number, 26% of them were transported, and 74% of them did not receive transport. Okay, so their cohort in the end, the participants were about two-thirds men. The average age was in their mid-60s. And their significant findings included that the participants who were transported, among the participants who were transported, their survival to discharge was 3.8%, while the participants who received on-site resuscitation, their survival rate was 12.6%, so higher, so Ooh. dramatically higher than the participants who were transported. And these effects consisted whether or not they were looking in their matched propensity score set or in a parallel unmatched, or less matched analysis that they also ran. Um, they also found favorable neurological outcomes reported with on-scene resuscitation versus transport. They found in adjusted analyses, there was about a 52% reduction in the risk of death associated with continued resuscitation on site compared to transport, and a 40% reduction in neurological outcomes associated with resuscitation on site. They found also an interesting, as I was mentioning about time, this in interesting threshold with time where kind of 20 minutes seemed to be this magical threshold in the context of their analysis where participants who were transported before 20 minutes had worse outcomes, but those who were transported after 20 minutes seemed to have better outcomes. So that's something we can kind of discuss. 
There were a number of the, the authors go into great detail, which I appreciate about the limitations of their mm -hmm. study, and they kind of line them up in a list. But there, there were some interesting ones. But overall, there were some, some data that was missing in terms of the quality of the resuscitation across all patients, whether they received advanced, they called it advanced life-saving support, or basic, or mechanical ventilation. But at the end of the day, what this study was demonstrating is that EMS or EMT is kind of taking over treatment, and then hospital-based resuscitation efforts do not seem better than to continue providing CPR or providing other life-saving interventions on the site when someone is having a heart attack in most situations. Mm -hmm. I, I would actually, if I could jump in there, I, I, I think there, there might be a slightly different interpretation to that because I, I don't think that we're necessarily talking about you know, the benefits of, of getting them to the hospital and having resuscitation occurring at the hospital. I, I think implicitly, and they don't do a very good job of, of saying this in the paper, that the difference is, is whether it's easier to do you know, resuscitation of a cardiac arrest on site versus is it easier to do that when you're in an ambulance and mm -hmm. the, the car is bouncing around and, you know, you, you know, EMTs generally work in pairs. And so when you're on the site, they're both working on the patient at the same time. When they're transporting, one of them is driving and the other one is bouncing around at the back of the van, trying to put in needles and, and do CPR and, and, and do all the treatments. And they're doing it one handed. You know, because one hand is actually holding onto the van so they don't go flying around, and the other one is trying to do all these procedures. So I, I, I think implicitly that's the comparison rather than necessarily what happens to them after the hospital or after they get to the hospital. But it's the, it's the challenge of doing resuscitation while you're bouncing around in the back of a van. Okay, so interesting study, and, and again, using the propensity score matching approach that we talked about last in our last episode i i you know there was you mentioned just these these different biases there were there were several things in here that i'd never really heard of before including prognostication bias but i think those are just different terms for things that i do know about which i think is really confounding by indication in that case and you were talking about the other the the time bias issue which i i think is a form of immortal time bias possibly or or prevalent exposure type Bias, where essentially, in order to to if you live if you if you're eligible for transport, you have to have survived a bit longer to be able to to get to the point of of transport, and so it is it is theoretically possible that you're creating some bias there, and that's what they're trying to undo with this time dependent right. propensity uh, propensity score model, which I thought was an interesting mm -hmm. approach. Chris, what what was your what was your take on the quality of the study? I, I, well, I thought the, the idea of using a propensity score matching again, like we did in the last episode around the convalescent plasma, was very sensible. This is something that's obviously very difficult to study in a randomized controlled trial. It might be in, impossible, and I, I wouldn't say absolutely, but it it is a, a challenging thing to do because obviously you can't obtain informed consent from someone who has had a cardiac arrest. So, you know, there there have been studies, of course, where they look at out-of-hospital resuscitation techniques mm -hmm. using a randomized design, but in those cases, they always approach it through a waiver of informed consent for obvious reasons. Yep. So, I, I don't know. I thought this was this was very interesting. I also was curious about the the sort of, you know, effect-modifying factor of, of the, the time to transport yep. with, like, early transport seeming to be uh, harmful and later transport being protective. And and I, I totally accept you know your theory, Matt, that this could all just be you know sort of complicated you know examples of immortal time bias. But it's also possible that this like that we're looking at a heterogeneous set of of conditions that lead to cardiac arrest, mm -hmm. and that some of them I, I would say may be more typical or mundane, like you have a heart attack. And then you go into some, you know, you have a ventricular fibrillation and then cardiac arrest there, thereby. And that, you know, those sort of very common causes of cardiac arrest, perhaps those are the ones that can be shocked back into a normal rhythm on site. And so that, that's the difference. And that, you you know, you're disturbing the patient by, by moving them and you're also probably reducing the quality of the resuscitation efforts by mm -hmm. having them in transport and resuscitating in the van. Whereas, you know, if there are a subset of cardiac arrests that are due to more complicated, you know, factors that would not be simply addressed by shocking in the field, but might require some other intervention that could only be delivered in the hospital, that might kind of start to skew it in the opposite direction for later resuscitations. But but I, I am really just totally speculating there. I, I, 
didn't really understand it, but it was curious. Yeah. So let me say, I had I had a fair bit of skepticism on this one, uh, to be totally honest with you all. I... I appreciated that that they did this propensity score matched approach. I, I, you know, as I said, I'm a fan of that. Although I would have liked to have seen a bit more detail, and I, I didn't really mention it on our last program, but I always want to see the propensity score model in in detail, and I want to see the distribution of those propensity scores. It would be nice to understand better. I felt like the the manuscript doesn't really tell us much about what it was that predicted who gets transport and who doesn't, because that would be pretty telling in terms of of why we think that. You know, people are are being transported versus getting on site resuscitation efforts. Now, the the starting point I think for this for me is it's worth noting, and I, I appreciated that the authors used the risk difference scale here instead of the relative risk, except when they switched over to this more complicated modeling approach. the The mortality in this case is is incredibly high. So the the survival to hospital discharge. You know, the effect sizes we're talking about are, are four and a half, four point six percent difference. But those are off of bases of four and eight point five percent. So the, the survival is incredibly low here. Mm-hmm. Not to say that if it's, you know, th- that that four percent difference isn't potentially very meaningful. If if you are the one who is in the situation, you'd much rather have a you know eight and a half percent chance of survival than a four percent chance. But when I look at the the change from the full study cohort, so the unmatched cohort to the matched cohort, it, the effect sizes drop down drops down from eight point eight percent difference between the two groups to four point six. So you're reducing the effect. Now I already have some skepticism about the the ability to control confounding in this particular case. When I see the effect size drop or the the association dropping like that, I start to think. Boy, you know, do I think that they have really measured these confounders very well, or do I think that even after they've adjusted and the effect size drops almost in half, you know, is it likely to actually drop further if you could fully control this confounding? And and my my hunch is that that yes, that you could could certainly get much closer to the null if these confounders were really well measured and you had others because you know they talk about this prognostication bias. You know, essentially the idea being that if you can predict who's going to do well, you you transport, you know, the, the ones that you don't think are going to do well and you, you do on site for the ones who you think are, you know, if you're good at that, then that is going to explain away most of the effect. And it's very hard to, to the association. It's very hard to remove that. So, you know, it's a bit unfair of me because essentially what I'm saying is because they had a fair bit of measured confounding, I'm skeptical that they they might have had actually more. But I, you know, that is where I end up. Mm-hmm. Jess, what, what's your what's your take on that? I had maybe not as nuanced a, th- a thought, but I agree that I think it, as the estimates continued to drop and the two groups started to look more similar as they continued to adjust for different levels of confounding, it did lead to the thought that maybe there's just unresolved confounding that's starting to explain these differences specifically as they relate to protocols that someone might use in an emergency situation to decide whether or not someone should be transported and information that they might be provided at that moment that maybe are not reflected in the EMR but are, you know has, has to do with you know just the way someone looks or someone's color or something like that that still might have some that might impose some difference in terms of the patient patients who are being transported versus the patients who are not being transported one of the things that that struck me in reading this paper was that they didn't mention racial breakdown of any of the study participants and there's been a good deal of data in the last few years showing that on the whole black people tend to experience less aggressive medical treatment yeah. given the same characteristics compared to compared to white people and so I would have been very interested to look at characteristics of people who were transported and who were not transported and severity of illness in those who were transported by race. And that wasn't something that was presented here. But I would hope that if this paper, if a, if a study like this was done in months from now, instead of in the past, that that, that would be an analysis that would be um, that would be included to provide a little more information potentially into heuristics or decision making in terms of who is who is transported and who is not transported. So the, so the race as a, as a proxy for racism, essentially the, the differences in medical care provided or the aggressiveness with which medical care is provided. 
Yes, that would be that was that was something that that struck me as as interesting and maybe left out of this analysis yeah. that I would have been interested to, to see. It is curious because we so seldom see a model that does not attempt to adjust for race. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so so I don't know that they didn't adjust for race so much as that race may have gone into the propensity score, uh-huh. uh, in which case what they essentially they did is they they matched on it. And I know that I wrote this down exactly what it is that they put into that propensity score, so I should be able to pull it up. They said age, sex, episode location, witnessed status, bystander or bystander CPR performed or not, interval from 911 call to EMS arrival, etiology, ALS unit first on scene, and treatment region. So I, I don't actually see it in there unless I just, just made a mistake and when I copied this no, over. No, I didn't see it either. I mean, it might be that it wasn't reliably available. Yeah. Yeah. Across all of their, across the, because they, they were consolidating data across 10 different sites into this consortium and so into this registry. And so it's possible that it wasn't uniformly available. Yeah. So the, the, the last thing I do want to go back to is, Chris, you mentioned this analysis that they did stratified by time period. Essentially, I think my understanding is the time period in which the transport occurred or an equivalent amount of time for a person who wasn't transported. And, and you know, I'm really struck by this analysis because there is this sort of perfect dose response with increasing time. The time periods are in five minute intervals from zero to five minutes up to 25 to 30 and then over 30. And the effects go from, as you say, highly protective to, to harmful. And with each increased period of time, the effect size, you know, is, is moving in a in an almost perfectly monotonic uh, pattern. And just something about that, to me, feels like that is your potential indicator that there is some sort of bias that they were trying to remove with these interval, you know, time dependent propensity scores, but that I'm I'm skeptical you could fully remove. But I I, I take your point, Chris, that that maybe it's the opposite. Maybe this is actually a sign of a very real phenomenon that's going on. But I struggle to understand why it would be so perfect and go from really harmful to really protective. Can you say can you say more about why you think that could be, Chris? Well, I guess I, I'm, I'm thinking that this this could be a, a description of case mix that, you know, let's imagine that there are all sorts of different reasons why one would go to, into a sudden cardiac arrest. And some of them are common and, you know, maybe best addressed on the site mm-hmm. with an efficient resuscitation right on the site, you know, using the tool, the effective tools that an EMT uh, possesses. And then there are some that are complicated which are just beyond the capacity of an EMT to manage and could only be dealt with, like, say, through a cardiac cath lab. And, and so if you're sort of putting those, those different causes of cardiac arrest on a spectrum that, you know, maybe you find that for the sort of the, you know, the run-of-the-mill common etiology cardiac arrests, that EMTs are best off just doing it on, on, on their own, using their own skills and their own, tech, you know, their own technologies and drugs on site giving an excellent resuscitation on site rather than a less than excellent resuscitation attempt by a single EMT while the car is moving, mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, the more complicated things where really there's nothing that the EM can, the EMTs can do themselves. They have to get it to, to a higher level of care. And, and, and so, you know, those would sort of fall on that spectrum of those as you sort of, you know, concentrate with one population of, of ideologies you know, benefiting from on-site resuscitation and the other one benefiting from off-site resuscitation. But that is that is just, you know, hypothesizing, trying to understand, is there a, a biological explanation we might be able to point to that would explain this funny result? Mm. Or is it, as you say, that there's there there is some sort of unresolved source of bias here? Yeah, I, so I appreciate your, your, your thoughts there because I, I hadn't really thought of it that way. And, you know, that does make me question what I'm thinking. I, it seems to me that those are two plausible options, and I don't know which one which one is right, but uh, it's certainly, I suppose, I should keep my mind open to that. Yeah. Any any other points anyone wants to, to raise before we move on? I, I don't have a, a point, but I had a question that I was hoping to, to, to pose to the two of you epidemiologists, because I don't mm. know very much about propensity score matching. I've never done a propensity score study so I, I, I sort of understand propensity scores based on what I've read on Wikipedia, which only gets you so far, <laughs> particularly me, because I don't understand what they said on Wikipedia. So, <laughs> but I, 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 I'm trying to figure out, like, how many 
how many ways can one get the same score and yet have the explanation of that score differ quite markedly? You know, so if like, like, like I'm imagining that, like, let's say there were 10 variables that they were matching on in this propensity score thing. And you could have one group of, of customers whose propensity score was driven by variables one through three and another group whose propensity score was driven by scores seven, eight, nine. And then they could have the same score, but the, the things that added up to that score might be very different. Is, is that possible? That is exactly possible. And the whole point here is, you know, it doesn't really matter what the reasons are why you ended up at that particular propensity score, as long as all of the variables that are common causes of the exposure and the outcome, so all the confounders are in your propensity score models, you will balance on average those two populations. And the way you can you can see that is that they show you the baseline characteristics for the full study cohort comparing the two groups in table one, and then they show you the propensity score match. And you can see that those populations after matching get closer together on all those baseline characteristics, age, sex, location, you know, all of those things. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter that each individual is perfectly balanced on each one of those things. All that matters is they are balanced in aggregate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that, that helps me a lot. And it kind of gets to my second question, which is, with the propensity score matching process, how would it deal with, say, interactions between variables? Yeah, so this is interesting because I, I hadn't really thought about this too much until you just brought up this issue. So I, I, I guess it doesn't, probably doesn't matter. I mean, you can, it's really interesting if you uh, stratify a lot of, of studies by the propensity score, you will often see of the effects of exposures on outcomes tend to differ because, you know, essentially the, the, the idea being that we don't just give treatments to people completely at random, that we give it to people that we think that are likely to do well on those treatments. And so the effects are often bigger in people with higher propensity scores, meaning people who were more likely to have gotten the exposure, whatever it is. Hmm. So I don't think the the fact that that people are not perfectly balanced in terms of those effect modifiers matters too much, but the propensity score is, is often an indicator of different effect sizes. Hmm. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thanks. I appreciated that too. I learned something. All right. Just well, I know, <laughs> hopefully everything that I said was right. If you're a propensity score expert and you're listening and everything I've just said is uh, antithetical to everything you believe, just... Uh, <laughs> well, it never bothered us in the past. <laughs> you can you can just tweet me about that at id.gill. Uh, that, that, I'll take That's that. That's right. right. I'll, I'll be the lightning rod on this one. <laughs> exactly. All right. So... Let's move on to our second segment. We're going to talk about a, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine called Precision Public Health as a Key Tool in the COVID-19 Response by Sonia Rasmussen, Yoon Curry, and Carlos Del Rio. And essentially what they are, are getting at is the idea that, you know, precision medicine has become a, a topic of, of a lot of conversation these days, that, you know, we need the, the right medicines at the right time for the right people, and that, you know, we shouldn't be just thinking about people in these very coarse groups. And they are proposing the idea, or it's not, I don't think that they've you know, invented the idea, but proposing the idea that that we need to, in response to COVID-19, but also in response to other issues, be thinking about the same idea for public health, precision public health. The idea being that we've got these very coarse tools at the moment for thinking about how we stop the 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 transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Lockdowns are an incredibly crude tool that if we say an entire state is going to lock down, that doesn't account for the fact that transmission is going on at, at the level of an individual and there's more transmission going on in some places than others. And so the way that we respond to those public health crises or those transmission in this particular case should be different based on what is actually happening at the level of communities, households, and things like that. In order to do that, of course, you have to have very good data and a very good understanding for how the particular uh, outbreak or public health crisis, whatever it is, is, is occurring. But it's an interesting idea that we have certainly been in a situation of these very crude lockdowns as our, our blunt instrument for dealing with pandemics or, or this pandemic. And, you know, it's not it's not really a very targeted and efficient approach. So I suppose I would pose the question to you all. I mean, to me, this 
this makes a lot of sense as an idea. The question is, is it is it realistic? Mm. Chris, let me let me start with you. What are your thoughts on this idea of precision public health, particularly as it relates to SARS-CoV-2, but but in general? Well, I, I guess I had the same sort of reaction that you, that you did, Matt, which is that like on on the one hand, sure, you know it's going to be more efficient to deliver interventions in a highly targeted way where, you know, the intervention is, is more precisely matched to the problem. Uh, of course that's true, but the, but the, you know, that's obviously true and it doesn't need to be proven. Right. I mean, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's self-evident that that's true. Mm -hmm. The problem is that in, in, in public health, we don't have that information most of the time and we don't have the time to get that information. And then we're really dealing with, you know uh, the the importance of timely and and consistent public health messaging. We can point to the current outbreak as a really example of where where that you know the consequences of when that doesn't happen, right? And you have really basic total chaos, and nobody knows what to do, and people argue about wearing masks or not, or social spacing or not, and you know you get these polar extremes of, of strange behavior. Like the other day, I was sailing in my boat in the middle of Wakoyat Bay, and I passed a, a lobsterman wearing a mask you know, a hundred yards away from me alone. Mm. And I'm thinking, okay, so we have gone wrong on our public health messaging because even though that's that's meritorious, it's also pointless, right? The COVID-19 is not out in the middle of Wakoyat Bay. We don't need to be wearing masks alone on a lobster boat by yourself <laughs> or mm. while you're driving on the highway alone in a car. You know, we don't need to wear a mask at. And yet we have failed on that basic, basic, basic message mm -hmm. to explain to people really why we're wearing masks. And so you have, you know, this whole contingent of people who don't want to wear masks at all and think the whole thing is rhubarb and people who wear masks, you know, sort of religiously to a point you know, beyond where any possible benefit can be accrued. Mm -hmm. and, and and neither of them are really right. I mean, they have the consequences of, of the two being wrong are totally dissimilar. One is harmless and the other one is, is not. And and yet, you know, this is why messages have to be really simple. And so I, 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 I agree that it would be better if we could get more specific, but I think the practicality is that sometimes it's better to just be simple. Mm. Yeah. Jess, what are your, what are your thoughts on this one? I actually, I love this paper. And the reason I did is because it's reinforcing work that I'm doing right now. Ah. So just a, a shout out to my environmental health colleagues at the School cool. of Public Health. So John Levy and Patricia Fabian, Kevin Lane and Prasad Patil in the biostatistics department. So I am involved right now in a project that is doing exactly this. And we are trying, we are trying to do exactly this. I will put the caveat on that we are looking at census track level data and town level COVID incidence data in Massachusetts, starting in Massachusetts with the goal that we are going to scale up nationally at some, at some point, looking at town level specific data on a whole, a whole host of different factors that may be related to COVID transmission. So these are predictors that have been gleaned in the course of a disparities research project led by my colleagues over many years. So these are data that are coming from the American Community Survey. These are data coming from census. These are environmental monitoring data about particulate matter in the air. This is weather data. These are data that's involving usage of public transit that comes from the state. There's data involving proportion of essential workers in a given community. And so we are really trying to the extent possible to kind of use publicly available data to be able to identify in a given community if you see an uptick what's going on in this given community? Is it being driven by the fact that, that there's housing, that there's crowding in housing, for example? Mm -hmm. And so someone might get infected and then they're not able to self-isolate or there's a lot of transmission within the household. Is that happening, for example? Is it happening because like, you know, they're in, for example, in Boston, there's a horde of university students who are coming back to campus and schools, for example, like Boston College are not doing a tremendous job of testing. And so, and so, how is how is that playing into you know the the factors there? Is it because there's interventions that are being promoted, but people in the community don't speak English, and the interventions are only in English? So, 
we're working in collaboration with the Department of Public Health on this project with the idea being, can we identify specific targeted interventions in different communities that might fit the needs or the specific demographics or the specific circumstance that is related to risk in that community? Mm. And we haven't gotten there yet, but that's the, the construct of the project. And so I think this is terrific. I think I, I hear what both of you are saying specifically as it relates to the quality of the data. Our efforts are entirely based on the quality of the data that's available, the timeliness of the data, does it reflect recent situation or is it five years ago or is it 10 years ago? Kind of what is the quality of that data as it relates to right now? And I also agree with Chris that I think as, as any of these efforts relate to messaging, they, they have to be simple. It, it would not make sense, for example, for DPH or you know, someone, some public health official to say, okay, to like make a public pronouncement that says, if you live in this town, do X. If you live in this town, do Y. If, you're, you know, if you live west of the Mass Pike, you, know, you got to wear a mask. And if you're east of the Mass Pike, you got to wear a face shield. You know, that, that doesn't make sense. I think there are, there are you know, but in terms of understanding driving risk factors, I think it, it could be very valuable. I agree with Jess. So I, 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 I agree with both of you. I, I fall a little bit it's sort of probably in the middle here. You know, I mean, we, I mean, as we speak, it seems like New York City is actually trying to do exactly this. They're trying to shut down, mm -hmm. you know, very specific zip codes to to deal with outbreaks. I guess my concern, I mean, I like the idea. It makes a lot of sense to me. I suppose the things I would worry about, and I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that they wouldn't be worried about this either, would be issues of, of equity that, you know, that these would not necessarily you'd be targeting areas for shutdown where the the outbreaks are happening, but you would you would not certainly be having an equitable distribution of who is bearing the burden. You know, you might decide that's that's okay in this particular case because again, that's where the burden is at that particular time. But the other thing is, you know, with something like SARS-CoV-2, it seems like one of the things that we've really learned is early action before there's a problem is what leads to the biggest impact. And so, you know, making this decision that we're going to guide everything by data seems to me it's very it's going to be very hard not to be reactive rather than proactive because you will be needing an indicator of spread in order to determine where this is going to, you know, where you're going to shut down. And by the time you have the spread, you know, to a certain extent, it's, it's too late, not in the sense that you couldn't start to control things, but, you know, it's going to take a while more than it would if you didn't have the spread happening at all. So I, I don't I don't know what the right answer is. And I, I, I'm not saying that, you know, I think that that this isn't a good idea. I think it is. I just think you'd want to think very carefully about it. Any any other thoughts anyone wants to add before we move on to our, our final segment? I think that's the exact challenge that we're running into with this sort of data is, you know, if we can, we can identify town level risk factors, for example, for June and July, and is that relevant for November? And we don't know. And so, so I think that's, that is, you've identified one of the, the clear challenges of doing this sort of work. So right. So right. All right. Well, let's move on then to our last segment, which is our amazing and amusing so I'm going to go first, and I would like to read to you. I, I, my amazing and amusing this week is an email that I got, and it relates to something that we have talked about before in this program. There was a particular paper that we looked at that I think this is getting at. You know, with all of the the spam emails and all of the journals, the the predatory journals that have come online, I, I find that I get so many emails that end up in my junk folder that I don't really have the time, energy, and mental capacity to actually go through and make sure my junk folder is working correctly. So mostly what I do is I just have a very quick look at my junk folder and see if there's any name that I recognize, pull that out. And if not, I just delete everything. And so I suspect I'm probably, mm -hmm. you know, missing some work emails that probably I shouldn't. But, <laughs> you know, most of all, I just, just trust the, the junk filter. For some reason, this is an, an email that ended up in my junk filter that I decided to look at, and I don't actually know whether or not it's junk or not. I mean, whether or not it's junk is probably an opinion, but I actually don't even know whether or not this is a, a real thing or a scam. But at the same time, I, I was really interested by it. So the email headline is New Clinical Science, and then it says twice daily treatment with amoxicillin for non-severe community-acquired pneumonia. 
that is the yeah. reason why I pulled it out of the junk mail folder sure. was because that is why. a topic that I'm interested in. And the reason that, that I sort of didn't then quickly look at it and delete it was the next line says, predict the outcome, $200 monthly sweepstake. <laughs> and so the primary it says a primary outcome of this phase two trial is clinical failure with 10 days of enrollment following a twice daily regimen of amoxicillin enrolling 1370 subjects the trial anticipates completion by june 2022 and then it says what is the likelihood that a significant number of subjects reach the primary outcome click below to select your prediction and a chance to win two hundred dollars, and it goes from hmm. not likely to extremely likely on a scale of one to five. It's like a now, hedge fund. Well, so <laughs> here's the thing about this: this fits with that 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 paper that we talked about, where you know, in the replication crisis, they have been trying to find ways to to identify what is and is not going to replicate, and they put to, you know set up these betting markets, and they found the betting markets were very accurate in terms of predicting which studies were were which found a significant finding were likely to replicate. And I thought, I don't hmm. know if this is legit or not. I'm not going to click on it to find out, but it strikes me as a really interesting idea. To, to see whether or not these these you know group level predictions would actually be as as good as what the science is I, and I to think determine you should, I think you gotta click on this map because I, I <laughs> I'd love to know now whether this was actually put out by a research group doing exactly that calibration experiment. So so my hesitation is I would have thought that it would have been made clearer to me in the email if that were the case. And it the email is is pretty slick looking. Huh. Um, you know, this isn't just sort of your your typical scam email. It's got, you know, some nicely put together uh, images for the for the Likert scale. So it just it I, I wasn't I wasn't sure enough to click on it. It does say learn more from the National Institutes of Health. So you know, and it does have have sponsored content. So, so maybe it's legit, maybe it's not. I just thought it was a really interesting idea. Huh. So, and I, Chris, I wondered if you had actually gotten the same email and just didn't see it because it ended up in your <laughs> your junk email. So be, I will, you, I'm going to forward it on. You're you're way ahead of me. I haven't looked at my junk email uh, mm. in a very long time, except recently when I was I was doing like that two factor authentication with my bank, and the emails were not coming, <laughs> and I found them, of course, in my my spam folder. So I was able to proceed and pay the rent, which is good. Um, yeah, that, that is to, paying the rent. I think is probably mm. a a good thing. Good for you. So, Chris, what do you got? Uh, I got a, a a nifty little a bit of ecology and animal behavior uh, and neurology all sort of bundled into one. <laughs> so, the the ecological experiment has to do with squirrels and hawks. So. Oh. Uh, and tulips. So a number of years ago, uh, it's like three years ago, I went to Mahoney's and I bought several hundred tulip bulbs and I planted them throughout my garden. Now I knew that the squirrels would eat them. So I'd like dip them in Tabasco sauce and red chili pepper, pepper and tried to dissuade them, but this did not work. So they, you know, the, the, the squirrels and the chipmunks dug up every one of those damn tulip bulbs. There was not a single one that survived. And it was like a buffet for months of the squirrels eating all my tulips. And I was really, you know, furious about this. But what can you do? Anyway, the predictable response is that the following spring, we had tons of chipmunks and squirrels in the garden who I had just fed with several hundred dollars worth of tulip bulbs. <laughs> and, and so the next thing that happened was that there was a bumper crop of hawks that were eating mm. all the squirrels and the, and the chipmunks in our garden. So it's like, you know, it's like, you know, Martin... Marlon Perkins' Wild Kingdom here going on in the back backwoods of Lincoln. So we've got tulip bulbs equal hawk chicks. And this year we had two hawk chicks. And so uh, we now have hawks all over the place eating the squirrels and the chipmunks vigorously. And sitting on my back porch, I watch them do it. And, and you get to watch the predations of these poor ground squirrels getting gobbled up by the, the you know, the, the raptors. And it, it, had me sort of primed for thinking about like what are sort of the behavioral mechanisms that squirrels and chipmunks use to not get eaten by hawks. And as I had this sort of like in the back of my mind, you know, the prepared mind is able to see the connections between things. I, I stumbled across this paper in the proceedings of the Royal Society B, whatever that means, but it's the Royal Society of England, something. One of their, it's like the National Academy of Sciences, except it's, it's more regal, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, they were talking about this very same issue about like how it is that, that, like prey avoid being eaten by predators based on movement. And their whole sort of premise starts with the fact that when you're camouflaged so that the hawk doesn't see you, the last thing you want to do is to move. But of course, if you want to eat, you've got to move. You can't sit there all day. You can't stay there all day. So you've got to move around. And so what is like the best strategy that a chipmunk or a squirrel will use to not get eaten by a hawk? And the answer is that they have to move suddenly and very fast and stop. 
Uh-huh. And that's what we see, and that's why we hit them with our cars all the time, huh. um, because they're evading the hawk predation, and and it has to do with the neurology of a hawk's vision. So you, you know, you 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 probably know that there are two ways that our eyes work. One is through so so called saccadic jumps, s a c c a d i c, which I think is French for leap. So saccadic jump is redundant. And then there's tracking vision. So when you see something in the periphery of your eye, your eye jumps to that thing and tries to localize it. And once you center it on your center of your vision, then it tracks and your eyes move slowly. And you have those two speeds. And that's really, those are the two ways that your eyes see things. It's something to leap and the other one is to track. And so when you're, when you're a chipmunk, you're, you're sort of playing the odds that on average, the hawk that's sort of swirling around, you know, circling around in the, in the air above the field, you know, most of the time, whatever it sees is going to statistically be in the peripheral of its vision. And so it's going to, it's going to have a saccadic jump. And so if you can time your dart so that you move and stop within like 0.2 milliseconds, which is shorter than the time it requires for, for, for a hawk's saccadic eye movement to track to that spot, you are not going to be seen. But if you make a longer move or a slower move, the hawk is going to get you. And so you want to go dart, stop, and then sort of fade back into the background and then dart, stop, and fade into the background. And that's how chipmunks evade hawks and how they get hit by cars. (laughs) Because darting and stopping in front of your car is not the right move if you're a chipmunk. (laughs) I have wondered, yeah, that's really interesting. I have wondered, I feel like over the course of my life, I have seen, and this is just my own anecdotal experience, a reduction in the number of squirrels, for example, hit by cars. I remember seeing them all, the, maybe it's just I remember them more as a kid because I was like, uh, you know, I was affected by it. But, And I've wondered if there's something with the advent of cars, I'm sure I'm not the only one, that affects you know, squirrel evolution because the ones that don't get hit by cars are the ones that live to reproduce. And so they must have a different, you know, a different movement movement pattern. And it's interesting to think if their movement pattern, though, in order to avoid cars, does that make you at greater risk to being eaten by a predator? Presumably, or, yes. Right. So I don't know what's going on. Well, this would be an interesting Darwinian here. pressure, right? <laughs> right. Who's going to win? The, the four-wheel or the, or the feather? Really interesting. I see. I mean, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and they like to ch- – we have a ton of chipmunks in my backyard, and they love to chase the chipmunks. And sometimes the chipmunks freeze. And I've always wondered, and then they get closer, and then the chipmunks scamper off. But I have wondered, and now, now I know. Totally makes sense. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, thanks. Oh, I have an interesting one. And stop me if you've, if you've heard this one before. This is a paper that was written and published in the Journal of Archaeological Science. Ooh, I like, this. I like that as a start. It has to do with feces. Excellent. Which was one of the subtopics of my doctoral dissertation. So that in my my past life, I spent a lot of time thinking along this along these lines, and so there there has been some archaeological evidence to suggest that early humans used frozen feces to make tools in Arctic communities. And so, right, so, so there's researchers who study this, like kind of creation of tools and like it, it makes sense, like right? Clay, if you, right? Right. Is it like clay and what, you know, if it's frozen, could you sculpt it into something useful, right? And so this team of researchers at Kent State decided to see if they could freeze poop and turn it into a usable knife, oh. um, which, I, which I thought was just like the, the coolest, craziest thing to do. And so what they did is they I think they did it themselves that they they simulated an arctic diet that might be what one would expect of of early humans living in the arctic so it was kind of high protein high protein high fat diet they they collected their feces they froze it and then they they sculpted it into a knife and in the article there's actually pictures of this of this device that they had created but unfortunately they found it did not cut meat it was not firm enough to cut the meat and actually the 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 quote from the article was it left streaks on the meat yeah, so I it bet. did not work and so and so they were saying that that was evidence of you know against the hypothesis that early humans were using our own feces as tools and that they did not withstand even kind of the level of, you know, in terms of using force, they didn't withstand enough force or the kind of body warmth that would be required to hold a tool to do something vigorous with it. But I was intrigued. I guess I'm I'm relieved to hear this, of course. (laughs) 
You know, recently, well, it would have opened up the door circles. to other problems, right? Yeah. Wow, that is interesting. I'm, I'm glad someone is studying these things personally. <laughs> Yes, I am. I am too. But it could have, I mean, it could have opened up the door for other kinds of, you know, cross-contamination of food if we'd continued that practice into into later years, if we're cutting our meat with our own yeah, feces. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a good long-term strategy, does it? It does not seem like a good long-term strategy. I agree. Yeah, I agree. That. So that's the end of our program. If you get any feedback on this or any other episode, you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at, at @pophealthyx. or you can tweet me at, at Prof Matt Fox or Chris at ID.Gill. Jess doesn't yet have the Twitter, so we'll have to go without. Or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthyx.org. We want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast. And Nick Guler for sound and editing things together in ways we don't truly understand. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you will download our next episode. Mm-hmm.